This is an interview by Bedford Lampkin of Mr. Ed Hamilton at 10846 Pine Hill Drive, Grass Valley. Today is July the 18th, 2006. So, Mr. Hamilton, uh, can we talk about your early life? Where were you born? I was born in, in uh, Verina, Iowa in 1907. And uh, <coughs> you want to know where I went from there? Yeah, where'd you go from there? Well, my dad homesteaded in Montana, a little town called Outlook, Montana, in 1910. And I stayed there <coughs> until uh, I got through high school. And then from there, I, I went to Minneapolis. I took up barber training at the Moeller Barber College. And um, I found out after working at that for a little bit, at 50 cents I wasn't, for the haircut, I wasn't making it, so I, uh, I, I took off and went to Butte, Montana, and uh, worked in the copper mines down there, where my brother was working there too. What did you do in the copper mines? Well, everything. We, I learned, uh, it was interesting to know, I didn't know anything about mining. And I, and I wrestled a job for all a couple of months, and I couldn't get a job. So I, I was got talking one day when I was in the crew of bunch was standing there, standing there waiting to see if I'd get a job. There was a big Finlander. He's about six foot four, big husky guy, 250. And he said, how long have you been wrestling? I told him about two months. He said, you really want to work? I said, yeah, I sure do. I've got to work. Okay, I'll take you on as a partner. And about that time, the super tanner came out and he motioned to him. He could see that tall guy out in there. They want them big guys, you know, they're good workers. And uh, he said, Come. went up there and he said, uh, You want to want to go to work? You got a partner? Yeah, I'm right here, heard this partner. He said, He wants to work, huh? Yeah. So there I was, and I didn't know anything about mining, but that Finlander. He taught me about mining, and uh, before I got through with them, I mean, he, he taught me a lot about mining, and I stayed there for a couple, three years. What were you paid? Uh, I was trying to think. Uh, it wasn't very much, but when, most of the time we worked on contract. We got so much for breaking timber and mucking, and. Uh, we made a little better money on that. We'll probably come out with, uh, we might have got $8 a day, maybe, something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I finally the company decided that they would work us uh, two weeks on and, and, and then we'd give us a week off. That would just keep us from starving to death. But yet, uh, they wouldn't uh, try to hold full time in the mine. So I put them then and I went to work for a, a monument company and uh, they had a, an old man, Kelly, who was running the quarry and we, we'd go out, I, I went out with him and he taught me all the stuff about quarry and rock, you know, how to, how to drill it, how to open up a big boulder and, and, and uh, I worked there for for uh, all the spare time they had, and then the rest of the time I, they put me setting tombstones during the memorial there. And uh, whenever that, I, I, I set tombstones in Dillon and Butte and uh, in Lankana, different places. And I uh, had a real good boss, and he said, I don't care how long it takes you, uh, but he said, just don't scratch on them whole rock because it, you know, one of those tombstones, because they are all polished and numbered and lettered and everything. So he finally said, he came out one day, and I had about two big nice stones, and he came over to Dillon, and he helped me a little bit there, because they were pretty big ones to handle. And we had everything, we put them, rubber pads, we put underneath them, and if we had to pry it where the bar was, I had to have a rubber pad between. And he finally helped me there, and then 
we, he took me lunch and then we, I wanted to go back to Beetle. But uh, I stayed in there for a while, but that was, I wanted, I wanted to go to California. My brother had already taken off and I gave him my car. I took my motorcycle and went back to home to Montana, out of Montana, and I helped the folks put in their crop, get in the winter's coal, and then I took off and went to Washington and worked in Apple that summer. And then 31, I came down here in September. And uh, finally, finally, I worked around here, cutting wood and doing a lot of jobs. Uh, I, I, was, I was in the wood business here for a while. I was selling pine for two dollars a deer, oak for four. Cutting it all, no chainsaw, it all cut by hand, cut hand saw. And uh, I finally, finally got a job out to the bullion. And uh, what did you do at the bullion? Uh, I, I got a job there as a skip tender and pump man. And. Uh, I don't know how I ever happened to get that. It was a good job. Wasn't no much, you know, hard work to it, but it was it put me in having known what to do. And you load the skips and send it up, and and then go down there. You take care of the pumps, start the pumps up, let them pump the water out. They they have to pump up about twice twice a day. And the, 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 all the bottom of the shaft where it was working, fifteen hundred. That was where the water all ran into that, and we pumped it from there up to the to the surface. And they, uh, what, what was your pay there? Do you remember? Um, let's see what we did get there. See, that's hard to remember that. It wasn't very big pay. I know that. Uh, it was probably around uh, five dollars a day. Oh, okay. Something like that. And then uh, when that, uh, mine, finally they had problems with the Empire Mine because they was giving, giving them trouble over saying that they were on their ledge, you know. Yes. So uh, we did some uh, what they call work, uh, just tracing the ledge and done some different shaft form over by where the freeway is now. And we found the ledge over there. But they couldn't prove anything. You can't fight the big company, so uh, I went. Uh, in the meantime, I had taken. Excuse me, Mr. Hamilton. Do you remember much about that controversy between the Empire and the Bullion about that ledge? Uh, it was it was a matter of laws. But the only thing is, uh, when you get a big company, you got a lot of money, and that uh, Bullion was a pretty small outfit. Yes. And, and they, they couldn't buck them, so they... Do you remember going to court over that? Uh, I think they did, but I, of course I wouldn't know too much about that because yeah. I never get involved in that. But anyway, after that, I had taken a, a course in uh, diesel engineering, and I went down to L.A., and I got a, I got a permit from the, from the mine, and that man there knew him pretty well. He let me go for three months. I went down there and did my shop work and got my certificate for this diesel engineer. And came back and I worked there until the mine closed. And then... Until uh, the bullion mine closed. Yeah, the bullion closed. And the Idaho Maryland had taken over from them then. And uh, they took all the men who worked there and they went over there. But uh, in the meantime, I, I got a job. They had a... Robinson Mine up near Quincy, and uh, they uh, they were putting in a, a big diesel engine for power there, and uh, it was a stupid thing to do. But they bought the, went clear down to Texas. They bought this big old engine and weighed about 45 tons. They hauled it up here, tore it all down, and brought it back up here. And I went through the, all the bearings and the connecting rods and I blew to all the bearings and done all that work and got it set up and low. And, uh, and then uh, when they got that done, they turned it over to the guys that was supposed to run it. And um, I came back down, of course that, that was Idaho Maryland. 
was involved in that, and they had been up there. So they put me to work here in Idaho, Maryland. I got a job there, and I was, I think I was running drift when I first went there, on about 2000. And I worked there for about uh, three years, I think. We got 598 a day. You got five what? 598. Oh, day. okay. And um, that was the pay. That was top pay. That was for timbermen and motormen and hoistmen. The miners got 475. And uh, anyway, we uh, we worked there a few years. In the meantime, I was in 1940. I was. Uh, working out there and I just, I had, in 39 I, I dug a basement here all by hand, all the dirt away, from 28 by 34. And I started this house on the 10th day of May. We moved in in September. My wife lived, done all, raised two little girls. One of them was just born while we was doing it. She lived in the garage and uh, she, I don't know how she ever managed it, but she did somehow. And uh, she, she slept in the garage, and I slept, as soon as I got the floor on here, I was in the basement. It was a little cooler down there. I could sleep down there. And uh, I worked eight, year, eight hours here on the, slept eight hours, worked eight hours on the house, eight hours to mine. And I mean, that, that was a lot of work. This is a four four bedroom home, and I built it all in in about well from May to September, and from where we could move into it, and uh, yeah, and then. Uh, what day year did you finish building this house? In 1940. 1940. Yeah. I uh, oh I did I did some work since and on you know I did a lot of finished work and stuff sure. that I didn't quite, but I mean it was livable when I moved in. But anyway, <coughs> uh, the superintendent had a brother-in-law um, at the Idaho, Maryland, and he wanted, he was one of the efficiencies he was supposed to be experts, and he said, well, you, you guys come down from the stopes and stuff. He said, you come down an hour early. That's when time and a half for Saturday came in. He said, uh, let's see, you'll work uh, at six hours, or eight hours. Uh, well, he said, well, we say you got six hours to get you down. So you have to work six hours at the old time before you, before you get the time and a half. And I might be so dang mad I went and got the union. I brought them in here. They had a company union here. And uh, they call it the Mine Workers Protective League. Actually, it was a Mine Owners Protective League, is what it was, to keep unions out. So they put, um, they finally found out I was, I was president of the union. So they they got, they had a notice that I was supposed to meet them down there at the hall. They, they were going to vote me out of, out of the union. I couldn't belong to their union. But I had, uh, I had about 1,300 members in there and that's, we went on strike, we saw for three weeks and they finally starved us to death. We had to go to back. So when I'm back to work and they had promised they wouldn't hold it against us. I had a pretty good job by then I was running motor and up on to 2000. And um, so anyway, I went down that morning and I got on the motor and the boss said, no, I said, you don't ride the motor anymore. Oh, I said, what? Well, I don't know. He said, you don't mind the motor. So they put me back in the stinkingest hole we had. They put you where? In, back in the, you know, in the stove, way back in the back, bad air. Yeah. And uh, it was the worst stinking hole they had in the mine. And I worked there about three, four days. And I was running on a tugger, pulling on a flat stove, and they had a, a what they call a tugger, a little motor with a cable on it and it rug a drag down and it would drag the rock down into the cars. And I didn't hear it coming, a big boulder come down ahead of it. And he hit me right in the head, knocked, drove my light through my hat. And uh, 
cut my eye all open. The wonder didn't kill me, but the, anyway, I, it was about a mile out to the, the main shaft. I walked out there with the guy who went with me. We got out there and I went to, went to the hospital. I was there a week or two. When I got out of there, it was really the best thing that ever happened. Because as soon as I got out of there, I was good, pretty good with the union. So I went down and told the carpenter man, Union, I said, I want a carpenter's card. Sure. So they gave me a card. I went to Sacramento. I got on. First day I went down there, I got right on, went out to Mather Field. I worked all through the sewer plant there. And you went, walked through the sewer plant? Yeah. They had to build a sewer plant there at Mather. Yeah. And, and then from there, I, I, while I was one of us working there, the boss come out to him and they said, do you want to have a welder? He said, there was a little plate about 12 inches square on the classifier and that's the only thing they needed. And I, I said, well, have well, you got a machine? They said, yeah, it's down there at the pumping plant. And I said, well, I can weld that on there because I had taken some welding training in Flanagan Grass Valley. So anyway, I, I went down and, and got the the welder hooked it on my car and I had a trailer, I was pulling a trailer house with me. I had a hitch on, hitch on there so I just went down there and got the welder and I brought it up there and welded that in and I said, when I go through I said, what are I do with this machine? He said, take it right back there and stay there. He said, that guy's been down there two weeks and he had not one pipe of old water. So I went to welding pipe down there and uh, when I finished that, I went down to the Bay Area and I went in as a pipe welder. And uh, I also had a carpenter's guy. But um, anyway, you, I worked there uh, in the winter and then uh, in the summer, next summer, I went to the carpenter work. I went over to Camp Stoneman, Camp Beal, and uh, Fort Ord. Um, I think I worked three, four camps, regular camps. And I came back to the shipyards and they froze me in there. I couldn't get out. So anyway, I worked there and I took my certified test. As a certified welder, she got $1.60 an hour and the journeyman only got $1.35. But What year was this? Uh, 1940. Uh, about 42, I think. Okay. 42, it's very 43. Anyway, I was stuck in there for about two years. And, uh, but then I finally got a leaderman's job, and I had a crew of 10 men. Uh, I trained some of my own welders, because I like pipe welders. So you don't train them right. But it's a little different than the, than the welding was on the ships. And, uh, and I finished it. Uh, there, just about 1946 uh, or 45, I guess it was, and um, I finally got out of the shipyards, and they put me on one a three times, and I and they, I'd go up to the office and tell them, and they said, well, we can't lose our sleeper littermen. They they're the ones that know how to build the ships, so they um, uh, <laughs> they would get me a deferment. I got three deferments. I never did that. Otherwise, I would have had to go into service, which I would never have liked. I'll tell you, I didn't want that. So um, anyway, when I finally uh, finished up there and got out of it, so I didn't have to stay anymore, I went over to Standard Sanitary, where they made bathtubs and sinks and stuff before the war. But during the war, they were making hand grenades and, and, and incendiary bombs. And they converted the plant over to that. Well, then I helped to convert the plant back to bathtubs. And they had to start up the furnaces again, put in new, new lines and air lines and stuff. And I worked there, and then a, a, another outfit went on strike. So I didn't want to belong, I didn't belong to them, so I, I got my tools, put them in my truck, and put all my stuff, and I came back to Grass Valley. Mr. Mr. Hamilton, if you want to take a break, I can turn the camera off and you can rest a while if you'd yeah. like.
No, that's fine. Okay. I mean, I'll take my, my, I have to drink a lot of water because I've had uh, bladder infection several times and I'm not drinking enough water so my daughter got this water. Good for her. <laughs> I drink a couple of bottles of that every day. Yeah, <clears throat> that's why. So you came back to Grass Valley? Yeah, I came back here. Of course, I had the house here anyway. And uh, so then, uh, before I came back, I noticed down there they were they were pouring a cement slab for a new dry there at the Standard Sanitary. And I thought, well, gee, Grass Valley ought to have that a ready mix plant. So I built a plant here. A ready mix plant? Yeah, 1945. I'd never seen a plant. But I built one. I run it for 14 years. And I, uh, I couldn't make enough out of that. So I finally, uh, I bought a tractor and a backhoe. I sold the plant to Hanson Brothers because they were already delivered gravel to me so they had the gravel and they wanted the plant pretty bad. I understand now they have bought up the big plant in Colfax now they own they're getting pretty big. And uh, so anyway I run the back wall for about, about ten years I think. Uh, put in sewer sewer lines and septic tanks. And uh, and then in the meantime, I, I had uh, a sister-in-law in Montana, over at Chester, Montana, so we'd go up there in the summertime. I'm, I'd work here in the, in the winter, and in, uh, in summer we'd go up there, and I helped them for two, three years running combine. And I find we went there every year for 30 years, and I'd go up there and go fishing. And I quit. I get retired. I'd given up. The, the wife, <coughs> the wife came out here in 1935. Of course, she was a school teacher in Montana that I had known before I came out here. In fact, I had a little orchestra right out of high school, and she was going to put on a dance at her school, and she wanted somebody to play for a dance, see if she could make enough money get a little pan out for the school. And so I went over there and I, and I met her and I went back the next day and, and uh, helped her clean up the floor and put the desk back in the school. And and I took her to a few shows and I went to Beaver, of course. And uh, I didn't see her then again until uh, the next summer she came down to Dillon, which is 50 miles from Beaver. It's a, it's a normal college there. She went down there for summer training in school teaching, and I used to go over there on, on the weekends and see her there. And I did that all the time she was down there. And and then when I left there, uh, Bill went there and of course worked in the in the apples. And then I came to Grass Valley, and I worked around here. Then from then on, but you are a musician though. Uh, yeah, I have, I've had about four different bands. I had a band right out of high school. I had a band, when I came back after the war, I started the next day, or next night, at Lamar Meadows. I played Lamar Meadows for five years, every Saturday night, every holiday. And I had old Matt Dennis and, and Wimpy on the, on the drums, and uh, uh, Bob, uh, Bob's name. He had a guitar. I'd have. Um, what instrument did you play? I played fiddle. And uh, we played out there. I think we had a five piece band there. And, and, and then afterwards, uh, um, after I re retired, I, uh, I had a little band. I, I, actually, I started. We had a, 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 a what they call a kitchen band first, and there was a little lady played piano, and she got sick and couldn't stay where she was in her mobile. I'd helped her in her mobile, 
some time, fixed her windows and stuff. Anyway, she was in, she went to the rest home, Meadowview. And uh, I went, went up to see her one day and she said, why don't you come up here and play with me? I said, okay, so I started up there. And then uh, my neighbor, Barry, up here came on, played the guitar. And we got a guy who played harmonica. We had another guy on the roof sticks and we had uh, another guitar. So we had about a six-piece band up there. And we played for 12 years. After after she died, then Red took over the piano. And um, so we played there for, for about 12 years. And uh, Did you make any money at it? No, it was all just donation. It was just, okay. a, fun, just a fun job. I mean, we, we enjoyed playing and the gang get together. And they enjoyed just coming up there because of people, you know, it was a lot of entertainment for them. So then, uh, after that, I decided in 2000, my wife passed away. And so I was here stuck alone. So the kids, I have two daughters, and they they said, well, maybe we should go down to Bret, Bret Hart and stay there where you have care. So I went there and I stayed a year, but I didn't like it down there. I wanted to be back in my own home. So uh, I came back here. I had a, I have a lady, a friend of mine that comes down here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and she makes my meals and cleans house. And Is that the lady that I talked to the uh, first time likely. I talked to? Yeah, probably okay. was. Anyway, she uh, she's a very nice lady. She's a neighbor of my daughter. My daughter lives out there to, at uh, near Chicago Park, and. Uh, What's your daughter's name? Uh, the one that's out there is Dorothy. Dorothy, and what's her last name? Chedwick. Chedwin? Chedwick, yeah. Chedwick. Okay. Yeah, they have a big place out there. He just finished a big garage, 34 by 34. Wow. Really nice floor in it and everything, beautiful place. And he's got a big house there and a lot of other buildings. But anyway, um, my other daughter lives in, in Livermore. Her husband has worked at the uh, Livermore Lab there, the Atomic Energy deal, and uh, he worked there. He's retired from there now, and she worked out there in the badge office. But anyway, the, um, this neighbor of, of Dorothy's, that's how she, she got acquainted. We went out to her place a couple times, and she said, well, I'll come out there and and help you three days a week. And, and she's very good on computers. And, uh, and I got a computer here and I was working that. But about two, uh, two years ago, I all the all ones got to feeling I didn't, shouldn't be driving anymore. So I turned my license in, give my car away. I give the car and pickup away and I went to my daughter. And, um, How old were you when you gave up driving? Uh, it was two years ago. I was 97. Okay. I think. But I got a little scary about it. You know, I was a, I had a friend down in Citrus Heights. I used to go down and see her. And um, I got, they had crazy drivers on that 89 Highway 80. It was wild. You're know, driving 65 and they passed you on both sides at 80 mile an hour. Oh yeah. Cutting in and out. So I figured, well, if, if I ever got in an accident, they'd say, well, I don't guy, he shouldn't be driving anyway. You know, it's his fault. So I said, well, I'll just give the car and pick up. I gave that then to my daughter. And um, I got this other gal to come out here and she, and she takes me wherever I want to go. Cooks my meal, make clean the house. Oh, good. And it, done, it worked out pretty good. And I, that way I can be here. And I got my, I planted my tomatoes and my squash there with the fireplace. It's the only place I can put it because the deer come through here, about four of them every night. <laughs> and they wipe out my rose bushes. I never see any roses there. Once in a while I can buy. But I put a little wire, wiring above the fence there so they can't quite reach over there. And uh, it's too narrow to jump over. I mean, no place to land much because it's so close in there. So they haven't really bothered much. 
And I've been gotten by there for two or three years now. I have pretty nice tomatoes there. But anyway, that's about uh, the end of the story there. I guess I'll be here in uh, November. I'll be 99. The end of November, you'll be 99. So yeah, what year were you born? 107. 07? 1907. So next year, I'll be 100 when it goes in November of 07. You're doing extremely well, aren't you? Let me ask you a question about mining. Did, did you ever have any dealings with silicosis? Uh, no, not really. I've been fairly, fairly healthy. I'm, um, I've had some terrible operations, though. I think in, in 1975, we were coming back from Montana, and we decided to stop in Soda Springs, Idaho, and do some fishing there. And we had a friend there. And I had a terrible pain one night. And I went into the hospital, and the doctors uh, thought I had appendicitis, and they operated, and they all, it wasn't an appendix. So they said, well, there was two old doctors there, they were brothers. And they said, I think uh, we didn't like the looks of the, uh, of the fluid that was with the brown your intestines there. So they pulled them all out through that opening and they found two feet of gangrene, like two, two feet of my intestine had died. Wow. So they uh, whacked them in two, spliced them back together, and they said, well, maybe it would. <laughs> and uh, I stayed there a week, and they finally got the ambulance. It was 75 miles to Pocatello, and they said, we'll get you down at the big hospital in Pocatello. So I went down there, and the doc looked at me and said, well, he told the wife, he said, I don't know what to do. He said, and I was swelling up a little bit. So finally he said, well, we'll just put him on intravenous and see if, if those intestines heal up. I was in there about uh, three weeks. And I finally got, I got nothing but intravenous on, uh, for all that time, that three weeks. And I got so weak. And finally they got started giving me a little hard candy and stuff like that. And they got stuff going through me. And got a few bowls of soup. I finally got out of there. And I had my son-in-law come up and get my trailer and pick up. My daughter came up and flew me back to uh, um, where my other, other dog was lived down there then. They flew me into there. And then I, I got my car. When I, my son-in-law came down, he picked up my car here and he brought it down to me. And we came back. And. Uh, well, wife, the wife was with me all the time, and uh, I stayed down there with my daughter for a while, and we came back here, and uh, I laid around here, but I, I finally, finally got to, got to where I could get around a little bit, but uh, I never did really get my health back. We used to go uh, from 1980 to 1990. We went to their trailer to Arizona, Mesa, Arizona, and I had a little band down there. We played around the, around the trailer court where we were, and um, we had a lot of fun with that. And uh, those fellows, would, I think they were most of them was Canadians. They called them snowbirds. Yeah. And, uh, and we had this little band. We played down there. We had a, we had a a guitar and a drummer and a, and a piano and a fiddle. Pretty nice, pretty nice little band. And we played out to the park and we played different places. We were with the Mormons and they had picnics out there. We used to go out and play with their picnics. And uh, they're nice people. I I enjoyed being them with the Mormons. We had some real nice friends in the Mormons. Good. And uh, a lot of them. And then we went. Sometimes we'd go up to their place in Idaho, and one summer we drove clear up to Canada, and we had a, they had a, a party one night, played for us when we was there, and when we had 21 people 
that were from Mesa that had been to Mesa when we knew down there. Twenty-one people showed up for that picnic or that party. So there was a lot of Canadians there right around Saskatchewan. And, and uh, so uh, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. What was your wife's maiden name? Her name was Tooby. And then there's a funny thing. What's her first name? Uh, Jenny. Jenny Stubby. Yeah. Jenny Stubby, yeah. They called him Stubby, most of them. Her sister, her sister married up there in Montana, a big farmer. And, and she had a, or he, her husband had a, had a sister, Lillian, and a sister-in-law, Lillian. And Lillian was, uh, with Jenny's sister, so that in order to separate them, everybody called her Stubby. Nobody ever called her anything but Stubby up that in that country. So that kind of separated a little bit. But uh, anyway, the uh, I was trying to think uh, uh, what I was going to say there. I'll just rest a minute while I think about that. Um, Oh, I was going to say, when we were in Mesa, uh, those ten years we went down there, there was a lot of real good dance halls. And we, we danced uh, at least three nights a week, different different uh, courts around there and places. There was one that had a trailer, or they had a dance hall. It was so big and they had about, oh, a couple, three hundred people in it. He wouldn't, in one time, they played one stanza of music, which usually go around four or five times in an ordinary dance hall. You wouldn't make it more than one time around that dance hall. It was that big. It was immense. But it was a nice floor, a good floor, and good music there, too. Mr. Hamlin, let me ask you a question. Were you ever an actual miner? Did you ever drill rock? Oh, lots of them. Lots of them. Did you drill with pneumatic drills? I drilled with. Every kind of a drill, I've run, run a jackhammer, I've run a, what they call a wiggle tail. A wiggle tail is, is a stoper that doesn't rotate the bit. You have to do, you have to take your handle and you work the handle oh, okay. in order to, to turn the drill. And then uh, then the other ones, then they have, uh, autom they have uh, the regular stopers that have, uh, uh, have water and uh, and, and, and rotate too, you know, automatic rotation. Yeah. Then I've driven, I've driven a drift in 2000. I had two automatic liners. Uh, they, they don't crank them, you know, norm, normal you know, liners where you drill holes with them in your drifts. They have a crank on them, you crank them in. But they came out with, with automatics. I had two automatic, one on each side of there. And I'm running those two automatic. One was running, I would turn the air, turn them back on, and it would back off by itself, take the steel out, put on a longer bit, next bit, you know, they got, you start out with a two foot, and then you go four foot, and then every two feet you had to change. And they drilled about, uh, usually about six feet each hole. How did you protect your ears? From and all that noise, I didn't. That's the reason I've got hearing aid. Oh, okay. It ruined my eyes. That, that, and when I was in the shipyard, they'd have chippers up on the deck, you know, where they made a bad weld. They would go in there with chippers and they chip that weld out and re-weld it. And I mean, those you get four or five of those chippers going over top of your head, and it just blow your blow your head out in there. You know, they were so loud. Yeah. The drills that you were drilling down at the mine, do they have the high pressure water in the tip of the drill? They have what? High pressure water? Oh yeah, there was to water. To reduce the dust? Yeah, there was water run through the machine all the time. They what, had, was that extremely effective in reducing the dust? Oh yeah, there was no dust after they got the machines where the ones the jackhammers were the worst, they, they run dry, old jackhammers, and, and, and the old wiggle tails were run dry, but the rest of them all had water on them. Okay. They, they, they was not much dust in at all. 
but of course they came, the mine owners claimed there was no cell phone and they had a, they had a doctor's affidavit so said that there was no no silicone in the guys and the guys were dying with the stuff but they, they got away from it anyway. They never did they never could get sued for it. But uh, they did keep it down the dust down pretty well though. They, they, so apparently some people still got silicosis. Oh yeah, I think they did. Uh, and then the, the guys that was especially the guys that worked on it before they got the water on everything. Yeah. I think most of the time when I worked down, I don't think there was any dry machines working anymore. But everything had water. And, uh, I, I've driven, I've driven raises in stopes, in drifts, cross cuts. Uh, I've done putting, putting anything. And I've run hoists. And, to run pumps, run the, uh, all the, all of the, everything they had in the mind of, of them at some time. The, the only thing I haven't done is diamond drilling. I, I've seen a diamond drill. I think I could, I could run a diamond drill. It, uh, but I had never, never had a chance. How about the hollow core drills? Did you ever have anything to do with the hollow core drills? Well, they're all hollow core. All of them that have water on them takes feet of water down through right to the bit. And out well, I'm thinking about the hollow core that went out there three or four hundred feet and brought back a section of of a drill that they could assay and find out if there was any gold out there. Well, that's that's what they call diamond drill. Oh, is that okay? That's diamond drill. They drill a core, and they 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 drill that whole country out there. In fact, they're drilling it now. Again, out of Maryland, is they're trying to open it up. I, I don't know. I think it looks like a stock scheme to you know sell people stock in a gold mine. But uh, they have lot of, done a lot of diamond drilling, and they claim they get gold, but I doubt it because there's no drifts ever come this side of Old Mine of Maryland. They have run out there a little ways, but they and if they have diamond drilled that whole country, all of it. And I'm sure if there's anything there, they'd have found it. Yeah. But they never drifted that way at all. Everything was drifted when mined all the way, all east and, and south, clear over, uh, clear over to the Brunswick. There's a there's a drift on 2000 level runs all the way from the Idaho Maryland to the Brunswick, which is about uh, two miles, I imagine. That drift there. And uh, I don't know anything about the Brunswick. I never worked there, but I know pretty well. I worked around on the Idaho pretty well, and I know I know what's there. And I, they talk about trying to open that mine. There's no way they could open that mine if they did. It was moving. I have seen timbers, 12, 14, and 16 inches, five feet long. That was broke. Two ways, right in the middle. Oh wow! From, from the end pressure, that whole country's moving. They never filled any of their stokes. They just blasted the timber out of them and said, "Let them collapse. We don't need it." Yeah. But what that, that happens then? The whole country is moving, and it, it's moving very slowly. But if they open it up again, every bit of the timber in it that's left will be inside of a week. You can. Taking a hood and full right out of it, it's rotten. It'll it'll stay pretty good as long as there's water on it. But as soon as the air hits, it goes rot. Yeah. And uh, it, if they ever tried to open it up, I mean the shaft would probably be, would collapse anyway. And, and uh, most of the most of the stoke country that is stoke would, would be all collapsed. And if you get them all moving, then there's nothing you can do with it. They can never open it up. The main, the main tunnel down from Dawn 2000 is pretty much uh, all hard rock, so it won't move. But that stuff has serpentine in it. That stuff is slippery. I mean, it it can move. And there's so when you figure the size of it, there's immense pressure 
that, that stuff is moving. Because I know they used to. They lowered that 2000 level, the one past three rays, they lowered that track twice while that was out there. It was so much pressure it was coming down and it squeeze up. And um, I, I know that was caused from, just from the ground that's moving. But they lowered the track about 18 inches. It wow. That much. They took it up, took the track up, and relayed it, and dug up that bottom. But uh, anyway. You about talked out? <laughs> just about, I guess. Well, let's take a break. Yeah. I couldn't even lift from them now. I put them things up alone. Yeah. I put a cleat on them all. I had a Dutchman, what they call a Dutchman. It's a, it's a pole. Yeah, that holds a, up the sheetrock. cross on it. I get it on my head and, and I drag that underneath it and I shoot throw it up until it would go straight up and down. And I go put the ladder there and I name her up. I got so I got I put them up all by myself. And yeah, I was strong in those days. You must have been. Yeah, I really was. Did you do the cabinets? Not these. I had these, the wife had these put in afterwards. I built them out of sugar pine. And they were a nice cabinet, but the only thing, they weren't fancy. And she said, oh, I'd just love to have some, some uh, nice cabinets. I said, well, go ahead and get them. Go ahead. That's quite a few later. So we put them, had a, I think we paid $800 so it's all for the cabinets. Wow. And the, uh, Dick Tremillon, you ever heard him down to me when his boy and another guy had a cabinet shop. And they put them in. I think later she had this desk put in there. I think we paid more for that <laughs> than we did for that all in cabinets. And then it used to be my refrigerator was in there under the under the stair under the place there. Um, anyway. Well, I said, I want to need a pantry so bad. Well, I said, I can make one, but you'll have to have your refrigerator out in the kitchen. Well, that's okay. So you can see, we, um, don't trip on my wire. No, no, I see it, I see it, I can see it. Oh, yeah. See, that used to be back in there. Uh huh. But it was kind of hard to do because it's all an angle. Everything's cut on an angle. But they, we, we did it in there. But she was very happy. She's got a nice pantry out of it. Sure. Nice pantry. And uh, uh, this, this, all this stuff here, they put that all in there. I think it was $800. That was quite a few years later, though. And uh, we've got uh, the main bedroom, the, the master bedroom is up there. And this here one is my, my bedroom here. And then we have two bedrooms upstairs where the kids were. Yeah, you've got a very nice house here. I think so. I, I just put uh, $5,000 more in it. I put that, uh, this, um, what do they call it? Uh, this siding, this plastic siding. Oh yeah, I know what you mean. I just had that done last summer, and uh, finished up the all these double pane windows. I put them in later years. I took the old windows out. This used to be the coldest room in the house, and now it's the warmest mm -hmm. and the coolest because it it uh, got the double pane windows all the way in the. Well, let's call that a day for the interview. Is that okay? That's fine.